just a minute, and, um, and in just a little bit, we'll stand right back up and uh, worship some more. Hey, uh, welcome, Christian Valley. It's good to see you here with us this morning. If you're watching online, we, uh, we appreciate that as well. We'd rather you be here, don't mind saying, but, uh, but we're glad you're tuned in this morning. Got a lot going on. I want to clear up as far as what we're doing on Wednesday night because um, it's getting ready to, to kind of be a busy season for us this summer. And so this Wednesday night, we're going to be here. We're going to have a meal at 6, 645. We'll have Bible study for all ages. And so come out and be a part of that. And then the following week on the 31st, maybe, whatever day that is, uh, the, a week from this Wednesday, we're not going to do anything, okay? And I'm gonna, we have a really good reason why. Because the pastor and the pastor's wife are taking a vacation, okay? And it's not a vacation if we have to get a lesson together and get somebody to teach us to make sure everything goes okay. So, we're going to take a week off, but that sets us up for the summer. And starting in uh, the first Wednesday night in June is the first of our five VBS nights for the year. We're going to do um, some fun stuff, some good stuff on Wednesday nights. Uh, we have a schedule. It's out there. If you need a schedule, it's out there in the lobby on the table. So grab one of those. Uh, we got a lot going on. We got two of those. We got some camps coming up in June. Uh, senior high camp, uh, grades nine through twelve, uh, starts the first week of June, and so uh, so we'll be taking some kids up there for that. Um, we got other camps coming up, and then June fourteen, I believe it is, is our small group night for June. And so make plans. We got a lot going on. We're going to keep you informed of all those things. It's going to be a fun summer. It's hard to believe summer's already here, but it is. I'm going to ask my buddy Griffin to come on up. He's going to read for us this morning. I love seeing these kids up here read, and Griffin is going to read for us. I'll extol you, O oh Lord, for you have drawn me up and have not let my fo foes rejoice over me. O oh Lord, my God, I cried to you for help, and you have healed me. O oh Lord, you have brought my soul up from Sheol. You have restored my life from among those who go down in the pit. Sing praises to the Lord, O oh you his, his saints, and give thanks to his holy name. For anger is but for a moment, and his favor is for a lifetime. Weeping may tarry for the night, but joy comes in the morning. As for me, I said in my prosperity, I shall never be moved. By your favor, O Lord, you made my mountain stand strong. You heard your faith, I dismayed. To you, O Lord, I cry, and to the Lord I plead for mercy. What profit is there in my death if I go down to the pit? Will the dust praise you for it, tell you your, of your faithfulness? O hear, o hear, hear O Lord, and be merciful to me. O Lord, be my helper. You have turned me for my morning, um, turned for me my morning into dancing. You have lo loosened my sackcloth and clothed me with gladness, that my glory may sing, sing your praise and not be silent. O Lord, my God, I will give thanks to you forever. All God's people said, "Amen." Amen. Amen. All right, good job. <laughs> the Lord will turn your morning into dancing. So just trust Him. Stand with me. We're going to pray again, and then we're going to worship. God, it is a good day to be in your house. We thank you so much for all you give us. I thank you for uh, for these young people who come up here each week and, and read for us. Your word, God, it's your word. We want to put it in our hearts so that we can live by those words. We love you, Lord. We thank you for the time we have to worship, the freedom we have to worship. We just do all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. <laughs>
Good morning. I am excited to be here this morning. I couldn't wait to get up here. My turn. It was my turn. Thank you, Olivia. And most of you that know me know that I am a Elvis fan. Okay? And believe me, this week Elvis was in the building out at ASU at the uh, Red Wolf Convention Center. And uh, Pam and Jerry Don and Kelly and I had the privilege of going out there and enjoying uh, one of the shows. And it, it was truly amazing. You know, they, those people out there don't like to be called Elvis impersonators. That, that's the wrong term. I made that mistake several years ago over in Memphis at Elvis Week. I was talking to one of them and they were really, you know, saying, hey, you guys are amazing. You Elvis impersonators are amazing, and she, he just stone look on his face. Oh, sir, we're not impersonators. That's not the point. We are Elvis tribute artists. You see, we give honor to the man and his body of work in the music industry. We pay tribute to him. We don't impersonate. <laughs> I said, got it. <laughs> but... It was an amazing time, and you know, I've often said, people that know me have heard me say this, you literally can't go one day in this country without seeing a reference to Elvis. You can't, if you know what you're looking for. Either you see it, you hear it, you know, something on the radio, or they use this song in a commercial, uh, you know, that kind of thing. But you and I know someone who is much, much greater. You can't go a second in this life without seeing a reference to Almighty God. Sometimes you wake up in the morning and see that sunrise. Sometimes you go to bed and you see that beautiful sunset that everybody loves taking pictures of and putting on Facebook. You know, it's just amazing the things that God can do. When you see Bo and uh, Tammy's little boy, Marshall, and that smile that little fella has, I tell Kelly all the time, that's the most photogenic kid I've ever seen. He can just light up the room with his smile. Or when Zaley or Bexley lets you hold them for the first time after you've been crying for months and months, it just melts an old man's heart. Those are the kind of things that we see from our God. It's amazing. He is a just unfathomable creator. And he deserves our love and our praise and our worship. And that's why we're here today. We come around this communion table every week. Because, for one, I believe it's necessary. Because you see, as humans, we have such short memories. Kelly tells me mine's getting shorter all the time. But we do. This is a weekly reminder for us as children of God to come around and thank him and praise him for the sacrifice that he has made. But you know, there's one thing about our God that we really need to keep in mind. Uh, over in Exodus, the 20th uh, book, we find the Ten Commandments. And the very first commandment, the very first one, that tells me it's important. It's numero uno. It's numero uno. It says, you shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol in the form of anything in heaven above or on earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. Now, Mitch mentioned a few minutes ago about how things are about to get busy. Our summer schedules are about to start. Life's already busy enough, folks. Um, you agree with me? Can I get an amen? Life is busy enough. But when we add in all the extra things that we like to do in summer, these are things that God has provided us. He 
he has placed in our lives nature. We like going to the lake. I love to go fishing. We like to play volleyball and baseball and basketball and football and all the things that go along with our children's busy schedule. But please, I implore you, don't forget about our first love. Over in the book of Revelation, chapter 2, verse 3, it says, you, and this is where he's talking to the Ephesians here. This is Jesus. This is in red letters. You have preserved and have endured hardship for my name and have not grown weary. Give ourselves a pat on the back. That's what he, he's doing to these folks right here. This is a good thing that they have done. Yet, I hold this against you. You have forsaken your first love. That's something that we do not want to fall into. So as you plan your activities this summer, keep in mind your first love. Our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and the faith that we have in him. Keep in mind, don't forsake the assembling yourselves together because your schedules get so busy, you push that part of your life aside for a while. We wouldn't like it if God did that to us. So remember that as we come around this table on a weekly basis, it's for us as humans to be reminded how important the sacrifice that our Lord and Savior made up on that cross of Calvary. Each one of us can have the confidence in our salvation. We don't have to guess about it. It's there because of what he did for you and for I. Let's bow our heads this morning. Father God, we come to you this morning truly with love in our hearts, with praise. We know our heart and our soul belongs to you. As we come around and partake of this cup and this bread, Father, which represents your shed blood that poured out on that cruel cross and your body sacrifice for us. Praise God that third day you raised and defeated death so that we may also do the same. These things we ask in Christ's most precious name. Amen.
I appreciate our men for serving today. If you would like to uh, help us with, uh, with uh, service communion, be sure and let me know. It's a great way to, to get involved and to, uh, to help our Sunday morning service. I told you a little bit earlier about some things we've got going on Wednesday night, summer plans. Talk to me about camp. I can help you get signed up. We're signing up uh, on, um, on uh, online. There's a way to sign up there. I've also got some paper forms in my office. also want to mention, and I want to say this generally because um, I just know how life is. If you have a child who needs or wants to go to camp and, um, and the camp tuition is a burden for you, let me know, okay? Because we've got people who will sponsor your child. And as a church, we will sponsor your child. So let me know if, uh, if that's uh, what's keeping you from signing your child up to go to camp. Talk to me discreetly, and we will certainly keep it that way. Um, as, um, as our men are, um, are finishing up here, I'm going to go ahead and let our kids head on back to uh, Children's Church. Fun time for them back there. I know they're going to be learning. Really appreciate those who are back there helping teach today. As always, a lot of kids heading back there. And, um, and I love to see them head on out of here uh, ready to learn. If you have your Bibles, you can uh, turn with me. Uh, there's an outline in your bulletin. You can turn ahead there. I'm just going to tell you today, I'm doing something different. I never really do this. I'll read out a different translation of the Bible sometimes. Uh, NIV, uh, ESV, New, um, New King James. I just switch it up sometimes. I used to didn't do that, but now I kind of do just to... to just because. I don't know why. Today I'm reading, uh, this is a, the story we're reading today is in the book of Daniel chapter 6, and it is a story that you've probably heard, even if you didn't attend Sunday school or VBS, and, um, and, and, and since it's a, a, a story that we heard as a child, I'm going to read it out of the New Living Translation, which reads a little bit more like something you would read as a child, but, uh, but I just like the way it read for this one, and so that's what I'm going to do today. Uh, Joshua chapter 1 verse 9 says, have I not commanded you? And so don't, don't overlook that first part that God says, hey, hold it just a second. Stop. This is, a, I'm, this is not a command. This is a reminder of a command. It's something we need to remember here. God has spoken and we're supposed to continually listen. Be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened. Do not be dismayed. Dismayed, uh, anxious, or in distress. We get dismayed a lot, okay? Uh, it, tomorrow morning is Monday, and it's a good chance that you may get a little bit dismayed before, before you ever leave home tomorrow. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Whatever you're doing, wherever you go, God is with you. And so this was a big job Joshua had ahead of him, and here the, God, the Lord is just saying, I got this, okay? Trust me. Two years ago, Robin and I went, when Robin and I were tweeners, you know, between kids and grandkids, we actually did some fun stuff. We, yeah, we got married early, we had kids early, we didn't get to do all the fun stuff, and so, and so we did that, like, after our kids became independent, and, um, and so a few years ago, she wanted to go to the zoo, I didn't want to go, I'll just be honest, all right? Well, I found out it, the zoo is a lot of fun if you're not chasing kids, okay? It was actually better, and so we went to the zoo. And, <coughs> excuse me, and I think um, I may have shared this story with you, but I, I can't help but think of it today in this story that we're going to read. We were walking around, and we get to what was called big cat country, okay? And, um, and, and there's this fence, right? And then a large sort of a ditch or a, a moat, maybe, I don't know, that separated us from the big cats, and, and I was looking, and there was different kind, I was looking at a picture, oh, that's this thing, and this, this, well, here came a lion, and this lion was not in any rush, and, uh, and this lion just sort of walked real slowly over to where we were standing, and stopped, and, and I thought, I'm going to have a stare down contest with this lion, and so I got planted, I was solid, and I looked at this lion, but I realized I immediately messed up because it was a female lion, and you're never going to but anyway, I, I looked, and this lion was looking at me, and I was looking at the lion, and then all of a sudden, the lion, I'm looking, and the lion didn't make a big deal out of nothing, just kind of looked at me, and barely opened its mouth, and let out a huge roar, and I was, 
Okay, she won. No problem. We're good. And I couldn't imagine going from where I was into that line. What do you call it? Country. I don't know, whatever that is. Uh, 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 where, the, where the lines live. I can't think of the name of what that's called. But anyway, it's, it's where the lines live in there. And so, um, uh, um, and now my brain just split me. I'm going to stop. I got to stop again. Um, but some people aren't as smart as that. And, um, and so I'm multitasking here. Uh, just give me, give me a second. Person in line. Enclosure. Enclosure. Line enclosure. I, 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 I'm thinking about I got it over here. I Googled it. Uh, I was not, I couldn't hear you. I could hear, I knew you were saying something. Couldn't hear you. Line enclosure. Google. Awesome. Right. <laughs> Uh, I want to show you a picture. People aren't very smart. First picture, this is in the Bronx Zoo in New York. Does that look smart to you? Huh? No. That, I promise, that's not, no, it's not good. The next picture is a little harder to see. This one I took off the internet, so it's not, it looks fake, but I took it with my camera off the internet. This was in uh, Taipei, I believe, and this man said he wanted to shake hands with a lion. Lions don't have hands, dude. Okay? I'm serious. And the next one is the one I want you to look at. Okay, well, this guy, seriously, it's in Delhi, and read, Google it. He said he wanted to tell the lion about Jesus. This did not end well. I'm just saying, look at that. I mean, somebody in mid attack right there got a picture of this lion that mauled this man. Don't, don't get in a lion enclosure, okay? Please don't, because I'm telling you, a person has no chance against a real live lion. So we read this story of Daniel, and, uh, and it's a, a good story. You probably saw it on Flannel Graph back in the day in Sunday school, and you heard about it. And here's the way we pictured it. That's the Daniel in the lion's den, right? Yeah, Daniel's young. He's smiling. And, and these lions, look at them. First of all, I've never seen a cat, look, any kind of cat, smile like that. They don't do that. Secondly, this is nothing like what was really happening here. In fact, I think a guy captured it better. Britton Revere, an artist, captured it in this one. Yeah, see, by now, Daniel was about 80 years old. Okay? Daniel was older, and these lions, they are mean, they're ferocious, but it's like my neighbors who have this invisible fence to keep their dog in. It's like God just put this hedge of protection around Daniel, and the lions couldn't get him. And so let's, before we start today, get this cartoon picture out of your mind. That was not what we're talking about. We're talking about an elderly man who was put in a, a, a cave, basically, a dungeon, with hungry lions, he would last about 30 seconds. But let's see what happened. By now, King Nebuchadnezzar was long gone, okay? Daniel actually served under three kings, and, uh, and, and, and King Darius was in charge. Now, King Darius was not nearly as evil as Nebuchadnezzar, but he wasn't perfect. And so, and so in his effort to grow the kingdom, what he did was set up 120 provinces with governors over those provinces, and he set up three presidents over those governors. He set up a little government here, and Daniel was one of those three. Let's read it in chapter 6, verse 1. Darius the Mede decided to divide the kingdom into 120 provinces, and he appointed a prince to rule over each province. The king also chose Daniel and two others as administrators to supervise the, the princes and to watch out for the king's interests. Daniel soon proved himself more capable than all the other administrators and princes. Because of his great ability, the king made plans to place him over the entire empire. Um, everything was going pretty well here for Daniel. He had risen from being uh, uh, taken into exile going through training and kind of doing it his own way to being one of the top three administrators in all the land. And it looked like that, that everything was great 
but it was kind of coming apart on the in, from the inside out here because the other two officials were jealous of Daniel. They didn't like what was going on. They wanted to take it down. And so today what I want to do here quickly into this text, because I really want to break it apart a little bit. It's a fluffy little story we love to read, but there's some good stuff in here. First thing I want you to see today is this. This is a truth in life. When the Lord raises you up, don't be surprised when people try to tear you down. Okay? It's a, it's a fact of life. We try to act like jealousy is not a sin. We smooth it over. Oh, wait, hold it. You mean to tell me jealousy is a sin compared to, like, murder? No, that doesn't make sense in our eyes. I'm just going to tell you, though, jealousy is wrong. It's evil. It's a sin. And one of the reasons that it's bad is because jealousy plants the seed for bigger stuff. All right? Jealousy might not have made you do anything sinful, but if it sits there long enough and it festers and brews, it's going to lead to some really bad thoughts, some bad actions, some bad words. And I'm just going to tell you, and I've been around this a lot in, in a lot of different things. It happens in the preacher circle. Uh, it especially happens in um, uh, when I was in a small business. It happened a lot. And even in, in some of my hobbies, such as uh, uh, officiating, this happens. There, a lot of folks don't want to see others be successful. I know that's groundbreaking news for you. You've probably been on the wrong side of that one. A lot of people do not enjoy seeing their peers, their co-workers, their friends, or even their family be successful. And so what do we try to do? We try to tear them down. Let's see what happened here to Daniel in verse 4. <clears throat> then the other administrators and princes began searching for some fault in the way Daniel was handling his affairs. But they couldn't find anything to criticize. He was faithful and honest and always responsible. So they concluded, our only chance of finding grounds for accusing Daniel will be in connection with the requirements of his religion. Let's stop there for just a second. I just want to tell you, if you are living in a way where the only bad thing somebody can say about you is that you are a good religious person then you're doing okay all right you, you're, you're kind of winning at life if that's the only thing they can find against you but they they were on a mission here and they weren't going to give up easy and you know? so they said well okay if this is all that daniel's doing different is he's doing a great job and um and and and, and he's really religious and so they decided we're gonna we're gonna uh, get Daniel in hot water through the fact that he loved his God. Now let me tell you, Satan was in the middle of this Daniel in the lion's den story. Have you ever thought about that? Daniel gets led to the mouth of a, of a den of lions, pushed in. The lions are in there, and we know that, that, that an angel was, was with Daniel this whole time, but don't forget that Satan was there too, okay? He is the root cause of what's going on here. This jealousy with these men came from their evil nature, and that came from Satan at work. Ephesians 6, 12. Ephesians 6:12. remember this verse, highlight this verse, put, put a mark in your Bible around this verse, for we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, okay? Even though a lot of times in life we feel like we are, we're not fighting against the people we see, <laughs> but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world. Why would it say that? Because the flesh and blood evil we see are just a connection and an extension of the, 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 the evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world against mighty powers in the dark world and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. So let's just make a, a let me get pointed here for just a second. If you're, if you're not ready to, to uh, face opposition because of your love and devotion to Jesus, then you're really not 100% committed to Jesus, are you? What is Terry at? We need to be a, a Jesus hidden artist. Is that right? Yeah, we need to be a Jesus. I'm back here in the back, but I heard that part. We need to be a, a Jesus tribute artist, not an impersonator, okay? We, we, we're never going to be Jesus, but we can act 
like Jesus, somebody who looks at us and say, hey, that's Jesus. If, if, you're, if you're not ready to, to stand up for what you believe and you are not uh, uh, worth, ready to, to fight a little opposition because of your belief, then you're just halfway, okay? These, these other two men here had, a, had an idea. They, they came up with a scheme, a plan, and they said, okay, we've got to come up with something that will trap Daniel because of his love for the Lord. And so they got this, they, they put it together, and they said, all right, here we go, we got a good one. They go to the king, hey, king, sir, uh, your, your honor, your majesty, all these good things. We were just thinking, you are like the best thing ever. You're the boss, right? And we think, all right, listen to, listen to this. We think there's too many religions. And you, king, are the one that everybody ought to worship. And so we were thinking for 30 days, one month, if anybody prays to any god, any person, any thing, any spiritual being, other than you, well, we think the lion's den would be a good place for them to hang out. And, um, and the king went for it. He signed a, a law, he signed a decree that said, okay, for 30 days, everybody got to worship me, nobody else. You can't, you can't worship anybody else. Now then, I'm going to give you all an opinion. You can take it or leave it. We read this. We think, oh, man, that's unfortunate. You know, doggone, ah, it's too bad. They just wanted to pray a little bit to their God, and they wanted to do their own thing, and now for 30 days, they can't do it. And we say, I can't believe that, that anybody would pass a law that would restrict you, your religion. I can't believe anybody would pass a law that would, would kind of squelch your, your ability to worship the God you want to worship. I think we need to read this a little more slowly, okay? Huh? Let's stop here for just a second. Let's put ourselves where Daniel was, because I think we may be where Daniel was in some way. Uh, it, if, if you look around, the walls are closing in on our freedom of religion. Don't take this for granted. Don't look at Daniel and say it was a fluffy story, a cartoon story about the lion's den. That's just the punishment part. It's getting more and more difficult to worship freely. It is. Take my word for it. It's getting much more, from where I started 24 years ago to where I am now, there's a lot of things I can't say right here, okay? And part of that's technology. Somebody can, can get it off, uh, off the web and, and, and send it out there, and all of a sudden, uh, you know, persecution comes. Uh, we're not going to offend any groups, okay? We can't do that. We can't say, sometimes you can't even say the truth. You can't even say what's in the Bible without it being uh, persecution, the, the, the laws and the rules and restrictions for churches are closing in. And I'm just going to tell you, when I read this story this week, something grabbed me that never has before. Daniel was punished for worshiping God. And we need to stand firm. I'm telling you, folks, don't move. Culture moves, we stand firm. Society moves, we stand firm. Your friend group moves, you stand firm. Know who you are, know where you are, know what you are, and stand there. Don't move. There's 51 countries right now in the world that you cannot carry a Bible. You'll be arrested. 51 countries that, that you cannot worship in public. You may be more than arrested. I'm just going to tell you, I don't want ours to be one of them. Stand firm. Take courage. Stand your ground. I said earlier that uh, Darius was a good king, but not a perfect king. Well, this pretty much is, is what happened here. Darius, uh, these guys came to him. They said, hey, king, uh, you're, you're better than everybody. You're even better than God. Huh? Let's, let's make this law. And Darius, it stroked his ego so much, his head swelled so big, he said, that is an awesome law. Let's do it. Give me the paper. He, he dipped his ink, signed it. Stamped it with his ring. It's a law. 30 days. He can't pray to anybody but the king. So here's this. 
question. And I want you to think about it. If a decree was issued today to punish those who were 100% committed to God, would you be punished? Would you be worried? Or would it just kind of be something that you didn't think much about? What would you do? We'd have options. Daniel had options. Option number one, he could just quit praying for a moment. Seriously, he could say, okay, and, and, and I think that's what Daniel was uh, kind of supposed to, expected to do anyway, not supposed to, he was expected to just quit praying for a month. And, uh, and we think, well, uh, a month of no prayer, that's kind of a big deal. I'm not sure. I'm being truthful today. I'm not sure. If you can miss church for a month, I'm pretty sure you can go a month without praying. Huh? There's probably been times in my adult life where I went a month and maybe uh, said something quick before I ate or right before I went to sleep, but real prayer, no, probably not. We're human. We're busy. We're distracted. A month, 30 days, you know what? When, so when you do something for a, a couple of days and it, it leads into a week and then a week leads into two weeks and pretty soon it becomes 28 days, it becomes a habit. <clears throat> and so if you don't pray for a month, um, then it's going to be a habit of not praying for a month. And Daniel knew that, and Daniel was not willing to compromise. So he said, that, no, that's not an option. So what's behind door number two? He could fake it. That, I mean, kind of, I'm just going to tell you, that kind of seems like, like the, the, the thing to do. All right? All right, well, I'm not going to kneel in the street at the certain time, or I'm not going to kneel out here in the field at the certain time. I'm not going to kneel in the, in the palace at the certain time when I'm supposed to pray. I'm just going to stand over in the corner and pray and act like I'm not doing, like I'm not praying. Doesn't that make sense? Just fake it a little bit. Like Daniel's over against the wall. He's just leaning up, acting like everything's cool, but the whole time he's praying. And so that way Daniel could say, well, I did what I compromised a little bit. I did my prayer, but I didn't get in trouble for it. He could ignore the decree and do what he had always done. And that's what Daniel chose. There comes a time when you stand at the crossroads and you realize that you have to choose to follow. Right? Am I going to be a, a God follower or am I going to be a world follower? Am I, am I going to blend in? Or am I going to be a Daniel? Choose wisely. Kneel and pray is what gives you the strength to stand. Let's see what Daniel did here, verse 10. But Daniel, but when Daniel learned that the law had been signed, he went home and knelt down as usual in his upstairs room with its windows open toward Jerusalem, and he prayed three times a day, just as he had always done, giving thanks to God. So here Daniel was. He was uh, taking his chance of being, coming up, you know, He's, he's going to die if he gets caught up here praying. And what does it say? He gave thanks to God. You know, I've talked a lot about prayer lately. I've had a rough year. Some of you have too. In fact, I look around this room and I see a lot of stories and I know a lot of your hearts and I know where you are in life and I know that a lot of you have had a rough year. But I'm going to tell you, I've prayed a lot through this rough year. I've prayed a, a lot for the health of my family. They've needed it. I've, in fact, I've talked about this some. I've prayed and my prayer life switched from physical healing to eternal healing. And that's very difficult to do. I prayed for the direction of this church. The direction of this church has changed me a lot, especially in the last two or three months, okay? I'm just going to tell you, I want us to be a committed group of Jesus-loving followers. And, and amen. And I'm just going to tell you, I quit counting people. I'm worried about discipleship of our souls here. Okay? And I've prayed a lot about it. I've prayed a lot of uh, intentional prayers for some of you who are going through dark valleys in life. And I'm just going to tell you, that is a, a part of my prayer life right now that I enjoy most. Well, I want you to tell me what you intentionally, I don't want unspoken prayer requests, okay? We can, anybody can do that. That, that, that. Those days are gone. Get rid of them. Throw them in the trash. I want you to tell me, this is where I'm go I am in life. This is what I'm going through. This is the sin I'm dealing with. This is my heartache. This is my heartbreak. This is what I need to pray for, and I will pray for you every day. In 
intensely, specifically, detailed prayer. Don't let your prayer life get stale, okay? Seriously. Don't let it get stale. Don't go 30 days. Prayer needs to be our first response, not our last resort. And it's got to be a part of your daily life. You notice what it said here in this verse? Verse 10, it says that he prayed three times a day, just as he had always done. Now, the Jews were on a schedule, okay? They had to pray at certain times. You don't have to do that, even though I'm just going to tell you. If you set an alarm in your, on your watch or in your phone, in your wherever, whatever your device is, that will remind you that's an awful thing. But it says, just as he had always done. And that took courage. I'm just going to tell you, it was a lifestyle for Daniel. He knew the 30-day break in his prayer life wasn't going to work out for him. And so when life gives you more than you can handle, and you find yourself looking at a lion's den, just pray. Last thing, do what you know is right. Okay? Do what you know is right and trust God with the results. This is faith. It, it, it's hard sometimes. We want to we wanna fix everything, but that's not the way it works. Daniel didn't know the end of the story. We look at this and we know the end of the story. We say, ah, yeah, it works out pretty good for Daniel. You know what he thought? Church. Funeral. Everybody just kind of talking about how good of a old boy he was. Nobody had ever been tossed in a den of lions and lived to tell about it. But here was Daniel. And so we have to ask, how did he feel when he was pushed through that hole and, and down into that dark cave? Do you think that, uh, that Daniel at some point might have thought, wow, God has just given up on me. God has forgotten me. I've been forsaken. And you know, King Darius, he, he had this moment of, of weakness where he signed this decree, but he felt terrible about what had happened here. He didn't want it to happen. He said, well, I can't undo a law. I'm not under, I, it's really, I've read that several times this week. He was the king. I don't see how he couldn't undo it. But he said, I can't undo my law. It's a law now. We've got to live by it. I'm sorry, Daniel, but I think your God's going to pull you through this deal. And so uh, Darius was a nervous wreck all night. He was asleep. At first light, he ran to the opening of the cave, and I love this part. He yelled at Daniel, hey, Daniel. And Daniel said, the, the, this is unbelievable. Daniel answered, long live the king. Are you kidding me? Mitch would have said, get me up out of here, and I'm going to kick you into the middle of next week, king. Huh? Seriously. He, he yelled at Daniel. Daniel yelled back, long live the king. Daniel's a better dude than I am. Verse 22. Let's see what happened here. Let's finish this story out. Verse 22 says, too many pages. Um, verse 22, my God sent his angel to shut the lion's mouth so that they would not hurt me, for I have been found innocent in his sight. And I have not wronged you, your majesty. The king was overjoyed and ordered that Daniel be lifted from the den. Not a scratch was found on him because he had trusted in his God. Then the king gave orders to arrest the men who had maliciously accused Daniel. He had them thrown in the lion's den along with their wives and children. Oops. They don't know what they did wrong. The lions leaped on them and tore them apart before they even hit the floor of the den. Now that's the way it's supposed to go. Then King Darius sent this message to the people of every race and nation and language throughout the world. Peace and prosperity to you. I decree that everyone throughout my kingdom should tremble with fear before the God of Daniel. For he is the living king and he will endure forever. His kingdom will never be destroyed and his rule will never end. He rescues and saves his people and performs miraculous signs and wonders in the heavens and on the earth. He has rescued Daniel from the power of the lion. It's a myth to think that you're never going to face opposition when you really put your faith and your trust in God. Don't live a myth. That's a Christian movie you're thinking about. Every one of them are the same. You know, you got that uh, guy who won't go to church and then life kind of, he, his life's in the toilet, but he finds some kid that kind of explains the whole thing to him and then all of a sudden he finds Jesus and everything's perfect and he never has enough trouble in the world. That doesn't happen. I think sometimes we put the story of Daniel in too small of a box, okay? We 
we do. This is the rise of Daniel, the fall of Daniel, the punishment of Daniel, the deliverance of Daniel. Hallelujah. I'm pretty sure Daniel would say it was a little more complicated than that. See, this is a real dark valley that Daniel has walked through here. He was being sentenced to death for doing nothing wrong. We like to jump past the hard stuff and, 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 the, and all the crazy stuff here and, and look at the deliverance of Daniel. But I think maybe deliverance in our world needs to be redefined a little bit. See, it doesn't mean that the, the rise and the fall never happened. It doesn't mean that the rise, the fall, the punishment, they didn't exist. Your story is full of rises and falls and punishments. And I'm sure, I'm sure you, you may have not literally spent the night in a lion's den, but you have promised you you've spent some dark, scary, frightening, lonely Jesus said to expect trouble and opposition in the world. He, he warned us, in this world you're going to have trouble. But then he said, you know what, here's the good news. I've overcome all that stuff. You're, you're good to go. I'm bigger than that. So when life comes down hard on you, you have three choices. You can quit. You can keep your relationship with Jesus private on the down low. Or you can let everybody know you're a follower and trust. Stand with me. I want to uh, give you a time here for prayer. I want to give you a time for a decision. I want to give you a time to get your heart right with God before you walk out of here. This world is a den of lions, okay? And there are a lot of people out there that want to throw you in, cover you up, and watch you be devoured. Put your faith in trust.
questions, ask us about them. We'll tell you all about it. I want to uh, mention Pat James this morning. He's back in the hospital. Pat was a servant to the Lord and a servant to this church for a long, long time. And um, we wouldn't be where we are today without his work here. And so I want you to continue to lift him up in prayer. He's going to be maybe moving tomorrow to a rehab facility here in town. And see if he can get some strength back. Um, also, my mom's back in the hospital. And, um, and so um, continue to pray for us and, um, and, and all the people around you. I'm telling you, pr- talk to me. And, um, and, and I will add you on my list of prayers. Uh, I love to uh, make a list. I've got a notebook in my office. I make a list and, and just, just dwell on those all week. Okay? Uh, Jerry Don's going to close us with prayer. Hope you have a great week, a safe week. And we want to see you here on Wednesday evening.